Hi guys, welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel. Tonight's session, Remote Observatories, what goes into it? Uh, the thinking behind this presentation is um, there are a couple ways to build an observatory, uh, but uh, the best thing you could do is put it in darker skies. But what if you don't live in dark skies? What, what are your options? Uh, that said, we have a, a great presentation from someone who uh, has done just that. But before we go into that, I do want to show off our image of the week. Uh, and I believe you see it. Stop me if you don't see it. Uh, but uh, this week's image of the week, uh, really interesting because I love this target. But uh, the perspective, or I should say the framing that the, uh, that the photographer put on this uh, made me look at it a few different times in a few different ways. Uh, so this is the cave nebula down here in the bottom right. Um, but uh, I, I'm sorry, I heard the echo of my voice. Which makes my brain hurt. Uh -huh. But uh, so you, they've got the cave nebula down here in the bottom right. You've got some amazing foreground dust and uh, also uh, just some really cool ref uh, reflection nebula. And uh, I don't know what I'm assuming might be Herbig Haro objects, although I'm not certain on that. Um, but just a really, really interesting framing of the cave nebula, something that uh, we've all probably shot but I can't say I've ever seen it in this particular framing. And uh, I looked at it a few times. I thought, oh, that must be a Southern target, something inaccessible to me. And then, no, it turns out that uh, the artist just did such a good job bringing out the features that you don't necessarily see that um, they uh, really uh, had a great image. So uh, Thomas Lilu, I'm sorry if I haven't said your name. Uh, Thomas, great, great job here. Uh, very impressive image. Um, and uh, as always, uh, if you guys want to submit, image, uh, go to our website, Image of the Week submission, hover right there. It'll let you submit your images, and uh, we can just admire them when you do. Thank you, Thomas, for submitting. Uh, keep them coming. Let's see. Got to find my screen back. Okay, so... Um, we have uh, Terry Robeson in the room. Terry, I have just given you the camera and uh, we see your presentation. Uh, present away. Okay, hi, my name is Terry. I'm uh, from Australia, as you can tell from my thick Aussie accent. Tonight we're gonna to be talking about remote observatories. And I can't see the cave nebula from here. It's really low in the north. <laughs> there are a lot of objects up there we'd like to image as well. Okay, this is a kind of an informal chat about uh, remote observatories. Basically, the challenges that I've come across, uh, expectations that you may have, some equipment recommendations, considerations that, that you really should think about, a little bit on power, a little bit on communications, and a little bit of protection of equipment, because my observatory is actually located several hundred kilometers from me. There's nobody around. There's no power, there's no communications. It's all out by himself, just sitting there all by himself. So I had to come up with a system that would allow me to recover in case I had some really interesting things happening. I'm going to focus more on domes because that's what I know most. I've, I've got a couple domes. I've got a little one here in the backyard, which I do all my prototype work in. And when I develop something, I will then move it out to the remote site. The domes really offer the maximum amount of space for the minimum amount of material. And that's pretty important because it does help with the cool down time. Um, you can really image in windy conditions and that's fairly important consideration as well. When you have a weather event, you don't have to worry about where the dome, where the, uh, the scope or the OTA is pointing. You just close the shutter with a, with a roll off you may have the issue where it's poking up and the uh, the, do the uh, roof coming back may actually clip the telescope or you may have a lot more complex systems in place to make sure it parks properly. But with the dome, it just shuts. And they look pretty cool. Uh, I guess some of the cons, pricing may be a consideration, but if you were to hire someone to build uh, even a roll off, you could be looking at very similar costs. They may attract unwanted attention, or, or they may not. Depends where they're located. I guess, first of all, what do you want to accomplish? 
um, many of you probably do a level of automation in the field setup. So you have your, you might have your scheduling, you might have whole plans for the night. You just rock up, you do all your polar alignment, and then you set up a script and away you go. Robotic observatory is mostly automatic, but does require a human involved. They got to actually start the process and it will go all night. A ro an autonomous robotic observatory is completely working all by itself. It will actually interrogate the weather conditions. It'll look at what's in the sky at the best place. It will take control and image only those targets. And that's pretty nice because you're looking through the least amount of atmosphere. Uh, how much you're prepared to spend? As you know, this is a really expensive hobby. You know, you can just throw as much money at it as you want. But as Adam was alluding, alluding to earlier, location, getting these things out into a dark site is really nice. I mean, the things that you can pick up compared to the city is phenomenal. Little dust lanes, very subtle features come out. Um, another um, consideration is, is actually power. Don't, uh, an observatory just sitting by itself just ticking over actually uses a surprising amount of power. I can use up to four kilowatts of power in a day. And my power requirements are not that high. I'm only using at most under 200 watts. But in the run of 24 hours, it can be several kilowatts. Um, do you have access to on-site communications? As you gather data, depending on the type of imaging, you may have massive band bandwidth requirements. That's something you have to get. And you need reliable communications as well. Uh, and if you can, if something goes wrong, can I call somebody? And unexpected visitors. So I was thinking more along the lines of big, scary, fuzzy spiders and stuff like that because I was at the dome yesterday and I had to clear out a few of those guys. They do look pretty funky. Uh, minimum requirements. A really nice go-to mount is, is essential. Um, there are many, many good mounts out there. And if you can control them, and more importantly, recover in the event of a disaster, that's very, very important. A dedicated computer. My recommendation here is uh, I do service for a living. When you set up a computer, minimum, minimum amount of uh, software. You have the base OS and only the things that you need. You don't want any other interactions going on. It makes it very challenging. You need a reliable focusing, focusing system. And there are several of them out there. And a fully controllable house. Again, this could be a roll-off uh, or a dome. And a whole bunch of software to tie it all together. And redundancies. You need redundancies for everything. I've typically tried to put in three ways of doing almost everything remotely. And sometimes I sit there and scratch my head saying, oh, gee, how do I do X from here? And, and usually I have a way out of it so far. After a couple of years, I've always been able to take care of it from here. You need cameras to inspect your equipment to see what's going on. And you need a microphone because you can get really, really interesting sounds. And if you're just only looking at it through a camera, you don't know what's going on. You might have a grinding sound. You, you may be turning your fans on. Nothing's happening. In fact, a few months ago, my camera was not cooling. It would, it would go down to its target temperature and increasingly go up and up and up and to the point where it was at about 15 degrees above. And what was wrong was my fans weren't running. So I turned on the microphone, turned on the camera, and I couldn't hear the fans running. I, th I immediately knew I had an issue with the fan, so I had to go out and visit the observatory and replace the fan. So a microphone is actually pretty important. Weather events are probably the scariest things of all. You have to protect your investment. There's a lot of money sitting out there. You need to be able to close. You need something to reliably close it. And I've got a couple systems in place that will, if one fails, the other one will take over. Uh, reliable power. Do you need a UPS? If you're on site, if you have your site has power, I would consider getting a UPS because power out in the bush is not that reliable. I do effectively have a UPS. I've got 11 kilowatt battery, which is a, which will probably go for a couple of days. Spare parts. I can't really emphasize this enough. I've got spare computers, spare controllers, cables, belts, everything, everything I need on site. 
because when you get up there to fix something, you don't know what you have. And then I've got a several hour drive to go get something. So I have to have everything on site. A lot of the control systems that we use, they just don't exist. So in my case, I've built quite a few of them. Uh, I have independent computers that look, that look after and do one task. They're not dependent on, on the CPU at all, the general processor. They will actually spin stuff up, take it down, all on schedules if the computer doesn't do that. So if, if the computer faults, the secondary system will continue going through and shut down equipment at the end of an observing run. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, internal cameras and microphone. If you ever have a lost telescope, you need to actually bring it back to a position where you can say, yeah, that's at home, and then allow yourself to get into position where you can recover your scope for the next night. Protect all your wires from everything. You need circuit breakers and ways of isolating equipment. This really helps you if you're doing diagnostics works where you can actually shut off components of your system. Now this is uh, generation one of one of my control systems. It's gone a lot further from here. This is when I was doing the initial setup in the backyard. Again, everything has to be fully fused. This is when I was doing uh, this prototype work, it was all just mounted on a board so I could actually see what version two will look like in the future. Military spec plugs are a very, very good choice. They're keyed, they're secure, you can't get them in incorrect, and they won't pull out because they actually do lock. Independent controllers everywhere. Uh, make use of watchdogs if the equipment has it. If your dome loses connection with, with the PC, have it shut down automatically. It doesn't matter if you miss a night. You gotta, you gotta control. You gotta take care of uh, protecting your equipment. Um, one of the systems I built here, that white box, that 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 was version one. It it has uh, twelve relays that are controllable through IP, simple network management protocols, or I can send it XML commands as well. It has something like thirty six programmable events per day. It has eight analog to digital converters. You could even sense proximity, humidity, light measurements, and have the relays act on those. Within that box, I have multiple voltage rails. I've got a particular voltage for the mount. I, I happen to run an, an astrophysics mount. They like something around 15, to, uh, 15 volts. Keeps them pretty happy in the wintertime. Uh, I have 12 volts for the computer on the, com uh, on the telescope. And uh, I have another voltage for something else that was fairly unique. And I also have 48 volts as well. Inside that box, kind of looks like this. Basically, it's a specialized home automation system, is what that is. What that is. And it has a built-in clock, and everything can be programmed into it. There on the bottom right, you'll see uh, analog to digital converters, and along the top, you'll see all the relays. And they're good for something like 250 volts at uh, 10 amps. So they will handle a lot. With your um, control systems, it gets pretty hard. Where do you, where do you locate them? In my case, um, I don't have any walls. The whole building rotates. I built a pier, and I've just attached the equipment onto here. This is uh, probably generation two here. Uh, in the foreground, that's the dome controller itself. On the front of that, you'll see that black finned device. That's a industrial PC that has no fans. I've elected to go for as few moving as few mo moving parts whenever possible. That guy is supposed to be able to run up to 70 degrees, and it gets pretty hot up there. And it's it's survived a year already, so that's that's a good <laughs> good start. This is the dome assembled in the backyard. In fact, you'll see it's sitting on a deck, and you see the dome on top. There's there's a, picture, a bit of the house in the for, in the background there. I had it sitting in the background for six to eight months here, and when I got to a point where it went something like six weeks without my entering the dome or doing anything, I was getting pretty confident that I could deploy it. Keep everything tidy. Short cable runs. You don't want any cables hanging on the floor where you're going to trip out, trip over it. You leave, you come home, something doesn't work. That's a disaster. Uh, this is a little slab I have in the backyard. You can elect to have a slab, but they can store heat. 
Um, if you're doing cable runs, you see that black guy? That goes down into a conduit that runs underground, which then goes off into the house. I've, I have network cables, communications, and power coming up through there. And that's a, that's a little um, 1.8 meter dome that I do all my prototyping on. See, if you do decide to go with the slab, seal, seal the bottom and seal the top. That'll slow the ing ingress of moisture and possible dew and the fine dust that continually will come out of a slab. You want to keep that down. Make your slab very, very flat. If you don't, you're going to have issues with your domes and rotation. If you can, separate the pier from the slab itself. In this case, I, I don't. Um, it's a very small dome. There's no room for a person there, really. It's only a 1.8 meter, six foot dome. It's like being in a uh, telephone booth with an angry robot when it starts moving. There's no place to escape. So uh, most cases, I'm not in that one. You can build an ele this is the, uh, the one out in the bush. You can build an elevated deck. All vibrations are kept away from the pier. They're on the outside legs, and they go in. So the most back close, but, but one and a half meters would be the closest vibration. And uh, to date, I haven't seen anything. Under that uh, pier there, there's uh, about a ton of concrete. So there's, there's nothing moving. There's less thermal mass with the decks as well. It's actually shading the ground below it during the daytime, which gets really, really hot. At nighttime, it's instantly cool. There's no equalization. It's really quite nice. It also allows you to run cables later on. You can feed them under the deck and come up. May add a bit of complexity but it's, um, it's actually quite a good solution. Off on the right, you can see that black area there. I've, that's actually screen. That actually slows down airflow when you get air coming up under the deck, like a laminar airflow, because it's a mesh. It'll also slow down insects coming in as well. The, uh, the deck can be prefabricated offsite. In fact, I have actually assembled it completely at home, had it running for about eight months, disassembled the whole thing and brought it out, out to the bush. So everything was all pre-drilled. Termites in this part of the world are pretty, uh, pretty destructive. Composites are a really good choice. Um, they can't eat it, and it stands up really, really well to the weather. But most importantly, it's shielding, it's actually shadowing the ground, and it doesn't heat up. Wind. Wind is also an issue. Um, because I'm off the grid, I've got uh, quite a few solar cells here. That's actually quite a large sail area. If you add up the square meterage on that, it's, it's significant. You couldn't hold it down in a strong wind. So everything here is built with steel. I made the whole assembly off-site, drilled everything all off-site, and uh, it was all built. And you just literally dropped the solar cells on and all the holes lined up. I got quite fortunate. And it was it was quite nice. You can probably see, uh, all the cables run underground as well. I'm um, I'm running uh, 3.7 kilowatts of uh, panels. Batteries. Uh, how much do you need? Well, one thing about batteries is when you read the side of the box, it isn't the full story. You have to consider how much can I discharge in one night and not kill the battery. Some batteries will only discharge 10%, then they start causing damage. Others will go 50, and some may even go to 100%, depending on the technology. Uh, so it's, it's, the state, it's the amount that they can be discharged, which dictates how much you have. In my case, I've got 11 kilowatts of batteries. I can reliably go down to, I can use 70% of the batteries per day, and it apparently is, is okay. They can actually go down to complete discharge several hundred times. This is a fairly new new technology that I'm, I'm using. It's a lead carbon battery. But if when looking at batteries, it's it's a, it's a huge world. There's a lot to choose from. I, um, I also went with the uh, lead carbon because I'll, I'll speak about that later on. The reasons why I went for this sort of battery. This is my little battery hut. Uh, so it's important to insulate it because it gets very, very hot. Batteries don't like heat. So try to do that. Ins insulate your hut. In my case, the solar, that little white box here, is where is there are seven breakers. And I've got um, the solar cells are hooked in series. So there's um, each 
out of each string of cells, I get about 115 volts. I can cut off each of these individually for diagnostic work and I can read voltages. So I could just run a one string of cells or I can turn them all on. So the power comes in through uh, this side here. It uh, then goes in through the inverters, which uh, the, the charger, which is a multi-point tracking system. This is a high DC voltage bus. This can discharge, I don't know, a crazy amount of power. So it, it got to have some pretty substantial cables. This big Frankenstein switch here has big, big um, 80 amp fuses in here. Uh, this then flows through to the DC component, which is 48 volts for my dome. Which, and then here, this is my mains power, which is 240 volts AC, which is used for the motors in the dome itself. And, um, and, and I have a workbench, which is generally a lot cleaner than this. I'm just checking stuff up. I was out visiting the dome yesterday. It also gives you a place to repair stuff, and there's you know there's fuses up here. There's I have a lot of stuff. Communications are up in here. I'll, I'll show you more about that later. Different battery technologies. Lead acid. You can use lead acid. It's very reliable, well tested, and there, and a lot is known about them. They do require some topping up of water. AGM is another technology. They're maintenance free. They can last up about, up to about 15 years. They can reliably use about 30% of the capacity per night, and not cause damage. Lithium batteries, deep discharges are possible, but they often require active cooling fans, and that's something I wanted to stay away from. I'm not there to listen to the fans. You know, it's something that could die. And the lead carbon battery, maintenance free, uh, deep discharge chemistry apparently is 20 years and no active cooling required. Weight is not an issue because I'm not picking up the batteries. Types of chargers. There's a uh, pulse width modulation, which is probably more the old school stuff, but they're only about 70% efficient. But a lot is known about them. They, uh, they only charge a much smaller part of the day as well because they, they need full power of their, uh, they need um, the solar cell output is closely matched to the battery, so you have to have uh, quite a lot of sun on on the panels. I'm using a MPPT system, which is a multi-point tracking point. It's a, lot, it's a little bit more efficient. It can be up as high as 95 percent. Um, in my case, I'm feeding in up to 115 volts. DC into a charger that kicks out 48 volts. So even when the sun is beyond the horizon, I'm still charging. In fact, um, I was just checking my charger right now. It's right now we're at uh, tw about midday here. At nine o'clock, my batteries are fully charged. Copper. Now, as your array increases, the cable length will increase. And as the cable length increases, you have voltage drop. So running 48 volts, or in my case, I'm actually running about 100 volts out of this. The cabling is quite small and it makes it a lot cheaper to run. In fact, the savings in, in copper uh, really make it a no-brainer in going to 48 volts. 48 volts will be cheaper if you're running a system out there. It's just the, the cabling costs are, are substantial. 12-volt system, you probably need a cable as big as your wrist for a long run. So, yeah. 48 volt systems are, are very, very efficient. This is um, live charging, an early morning snapshot. So you can see that um, with the multi point tracking, we've actually got 12 amps coming out of the array, but it's actually shoving 21 amps into the batteries. Because we have, uh, in this case, this is a very early, or very early morning, we only have 91 volts coming out of the uh, out of the array, we're still able to put a honking big charge into the batteries, which is really good. If this was the other type of the pulse width modulation, this wouldn't be happening. And we're, I'm already I'm in the absorption phase right now, and eventually that would uh, tick over to uh, floating. These are um, counters of uh, power that's come. So that's, uh, there's what 1,254 kilowatts have come out of there. So that's that's a bit. I'm able to look at history as well. This is all in the charger. I can I can see these at home on my screen at any time I want. 
I have a history. You can see there's a minimum battery temperature. So we're down to three degrees here. And this is in an insulated hut as well. Whoops, sorry about that. Um, and you can see this is the most important bit here, floating. Every day we hit float, which means the batteries are fully charged. And you can see their voltage here. The, the voltage, um, minimum voltage is about 49 volts. So they're still in pretty good condition for a 48 volt bank. Communications. Where I'm at, there's there's nothing around me, so I have to uh, I had to come up with a way of getting stuff. We we initially tried uh, 3G, but there was just not enough bandwidth, and the signal is pretty poor. What I'm using here is a 4G cellular network, and this little guy in the middle is an industrial modem. This is my communications mast. I got some Yagi antennas pointing to a target quite far away. And I'm getting download speeds and upload speeds of about 60 megabits per second, which is actually better than my home. Uh, it's, it uses, it aggregates multiple antennas. So I, I, I get that combined bandwidth. On top of here, you'll see a little wind meter. Beside him, there's a daytime sky camera. There's a, the little clear guy here is a another rain sensor. This is a AAG clay, uh, cloud watcher here. Now this little modem, very, very low power requirements. It has a built-in firewall and it can, it can control relays. I can also send it SMS messages. I can get my, my mobile phone and just say reboot and the whole system will reboot, auto initialize and rehome. I can go AC off. I can turn off all the AC power. It will kill my uh, switches, it'll, it'll, it'll kill the power to the dome. All things running on the AC circuitry will all die. And I'd send another message AC on, it'll all turn it back on. I could do the same with DC as well. Uh, I also have um, Raspberry Pis uh, in there as well for an SSH and OpenVPN access. So I've got VPN access into the modem. I've got VPN access into a Raspberry Pi. I got secure shell to a PC. I got secure shell to a Raspberry Pi. I can I can get onto the the modem even allows shell access where I can get into there as well. So lots of redundancies. This this allows direct access to the IP controllers. Harry, if the, uh, yeah, yeah yeah. Uh, previous slide, uh, Nicole is asking whether it's a metal shed that I believe is your battery shed. Yes, it is. It is? Okay. Yes. Yep. And uh, in behind there, it's insulated as well. There's going to be one change that we'll make this year with the battery shed. I'm going to uh, make a frame around the battery shed that has shade cloth just to take a bit more, uh, just to try and cool it a bit because it gets pretty hot here. Mm hmm I have a question too. Um, yeah, you're getting 50 megabits per second. Is yeah. that with a typical cell phone plan, or do you have some super plan? No, that, that's that's just a normal plan. Really? Yeah. So it's it's a MIMO antenna, which is um, it's aggregate signals. So I I can actually receive two like two streams of data down those antennas. Huh. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's an industrial antenna, and uh, I'm sure you can do that up there as well because uh, it's that technology has been around for a while. Yeah, I my I think what they do here though is I think they limit the amount of bandwidth you can get per account, or they kind of uh, cut back on it to limit um, basically everyone overusing the bandwidth and everything getting slowed down. But uh, what they what they do here is it's how much you use here is when they cut you off. So I'm I'm using about uh, ten gigabytes. No, uh, sorry, so ten uh, ten megabytes. Is it ten per per, per month? Uh, Probably 10, 10, gig, 10, 10, 10, 10 gig per month. Yeah, and that's all the data that comes down and me getting on there. And everything I've done is is low bandwidth. So I use shell access. I I I will come in through a web page and control it. I don't get on the console very often because that uses a lot of bandwidth. So we we have um, fairly tight bandwidth restrictions, like I'm sorry, a bandwidth, but um, how much you can download. Mm -hmm. So if, they, if um, you use it all really quick, you're in trouble. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And I have done that initially because I was watching my cameras, and I go, and then I, and then all of a sudden I ran out of my data. And went, oh, bugger. <laughs> <Yeah>. Um. Other. <laughs> Yeah, Other yeah. Question. Does it get, uh, Nicole's asking, does it get hot inside the metal shed? I'm assuming so because you're considering a shade cloth, but. 
Yeah, it's it's still cooler than outside because the concrete slab, uh, the batteries are down low, and it's 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 um, not nearly as hot as outside. Mm -hmm. You know, it can get up you know close to fifty degrees. You know, it's insane. I don't know how uh, how you live out there. <laughs> um, the uh, the uh, David's asking line of sight for the antenna. Yes, yes. So what what I did, uh, I found a, um, a specialist in in um, this sort of communications, and they uh, they actually have topology maps of all the areas and where towers are, and which bandwidths are available on each tower. So I, I I got the exact GPS coordinates and sent them off to him, and he reckoned there was a a, a, a tower in that direction. So I went playing, and 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 eventually I found it. And, um, and there was a little bit of a, a hill and a large dip, but it was I could still see it. The tower was up uh, high enough that I could see it, but line of sight would be an issue. Correct. Yeah, I was actually at an AT and T store recently, and I got to see those. Uh um maps of coverage which uh would be interesting for doing something like this maybe a local provider would be able to help you uh, uh, it's actually it's actually online i i went looking for the really? website and i couldn't I, I couldn't find it and um they had all the topology maps and everything it, two 2d maps so you could actually see the height of the hills and where you are at the elevation and then you can say oh there's a there's a hill clipping it i can't do the signal here Unless I elevate the, t the tower this high and things like that, it was actually quite quite interesting. Interesting. <clears throat> um, okay, now yeah, maybe I'll ask my other question because it will refer yeah. to the previous slide as well. Um, you said uh, you're using uh, so obviously in Australia uh, 220. Uh, 240. Two forty. Two two forty. Um, yep. What uh, what gear? gets powered off of that was doing just 12 volt from your 48 volt a, a possibility or no i run um the batteries are 48 volts i run 48 volts from the battery shed to the dome and in the dome i drop it down to 12 volts again this is all about uh, voltage losses because you want to have maximum efficiency you keep the batteries uh, you keep the voltage high as long as you can mm -hmm. and but the cable I the cable yeah, you must be using right. an inverter to get it to uh, uh, AC. Yeah, that that was that little uh, blue box here. Uh, let's just run back here. Um, my battery shed. One sec. Sorry about this. That little blue box here. Gotcha. Hey, whoops, whoops. Behind the water bottle there. Where'd it go? Yeah, that's that's uh, an eight hundred watt inverter because that's all I need. Uh, my max usage is it was everything like opening shutters rotating and whatever is maybe 250 to 270 mm -hmm. watts that that's more okay. than enough so the, your dome control is mostly AC. yep and my switch okay so it yeah, so, so one of the things about a switch is you can lose a port and you need to cycle it so then if i if i do that how do i cycle the power of a switch well i just send the command ac off cuts ac to everything and then AC on, and then my switch has been reset. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, that's okay. Uh, with oh, additional communications, yeah. So you can run Team Viewer. I uh, think Tolga had some stories about Team Viewer. You can have other things. You can run VNC through a broker as well, Tolga. So um, with the Raspberry Pis, they actually come with a with a license for um, running a a VNC server that goes through a broker service. So it's not a direct direct, so it is an encrypted uh, connection. You don't have any sound on it, but um, it, it, is a, it is a great fallback. You can also use RDP for console access. Um, I can get, I've got uh, various ways of getting VPNs and um, access in there. You can also run, you can also run um, remote access through a secure shell, if you want, as well, which which is what I do. I've tied every, I've tied everything down to my uh, to my uh, my home here. I have a static IP address, remote static IP address here, and I've got tunnels, and they will only answer to communications to here. I do networking for a living, so that's that's pretty pretty easy stuff, really. Um, safety considerations: uh, wind. Uh, that was the little guy on the mast that you saw. 
uh, and all of, and the uh, the rain sensors. There are multiple rain sensors there. We talked about equipment hangs. If you if you can't recover something, in my case, I'll just send a, a reboot message to my um, to my equipment. I can also reboot the modem remotely as well through SMS messages. Watchdogs use them whenever possible. As we, as I sort of alluded to that before, if I lose communication to the dome, it will shut. If the computer is not responding after a while, it will reset itself. Try to do that anywhere you can with stand with uh, standalone controllers or watchdogs. Redundancies are key here because there's no one else around. This little guy here is a little Raspberry Pi sitting out in the middle of the field. That is actually a VPN server, a secure shell server, and all sky camera. Just another system that I've stuck out there. Why not put that all in there? And I can actually get to that from the from the network. Speaking of cameras, I've got a I've got a all I've got a daytime all sky camera, so I can check stuff there. Or if it's during a full moon uh, and it overwhelms my night sky camera, the day sky camera allows me to see all the clouds. So I can just toggle between the two. If you, this, this is a fairly recent one here. You could, that's that's what our skies look over here. That's the planets you can see running across there, and that's the core of the of our galaxy straight overhead, which is really sweet. This is a light panel. I was just checking to make sure it was all lined up, and this is a uh, a shot of the camera. Uh, sorry, a shot of my telescope. I think from this morning, and you know the sun is up. It shines through. It's a fairly sensitive camera. Keep it neat. Try to keep the floor clear of cables. That's the last thing you want to do. Be, to do is trip over a cable. You could be walking, snag a cable, not realize it, get home, and go. Why can't I start my telescope? <laughs> Simplifier wiring. If it looks right and and neat, it generally is. Keep your wire short. Longer wires actually use more more power. Secure consumer connections if possible. This is USB connectors. I don't really like USB connectors. It's a consumer device. They don't secure very well. If you have a, a cameras that are rotating around, they may work them well so, themselves out. Spend a lot of time on your cable management. It could be the cause of all your funky guiding as well. You could have something dragging, dragging, swaying a bit, and it will make your telescope oscillate. And try to identify any connections that could get pulled apart. Because, again, in my case, there's no one there to go back. I know a lot of people say, well, I run remote in the backyard. and you, What's so hard about that? Well, you, you can just walk out back there and jiggle something. I can't. It's far away. So I have to make sure everything is working. The I guess the advantages of all this, you get your life back. You can actually sleep at night while your little robot goes to work. Uh, no more all-nighters and you are fully rested for the next day. <laughs> I do try to, it does image at the best part of the sky, which is straight up. Um, images whenever it gets an opportunity. It could be cloudy for the first three quarters of the night, then open up and you'll get a couple shots. That's, that's quite nice. The robot will pack up and retreat into its shell whenever the weather turns bad. It's kind of fun to watch. And they, they never tire. They're super enthusiastic guys. They're just waiting to work for you. They love that. <laughs> so I guess wrapping up, be, a re be realistic of what you're trying to accomplish. You can do, there's a lot of technologies out there. Pulling it all together is, um, is fun. Trolley your system in your backyard for a minimum of six months. I know it sounds like a long time, but you really need to do that because you'll just keep refining things and little stuff will creep up and you just address it before you move it out there. Develop a change management system for any updates that you apply. Every time I go out, I image the system. I have a history of every visit I've gone out with a full image of the system. Document everything. I don't know about you, but I forget stuff all the time. I have to write it down, otherwise I lose it. Image or remote computer? Yep. Uh, develop a list of procedures for recovering a lost scope. How, how do you do it? If you're not there to actually bring it back to the park position, you know, if you're too far off, will your plate solving work? What if team? What if you can't get in through team team viewer? Do I have another way of getting onto my console? Write it all down, and really try to have fun with this stuff. Don't take it too seriously. 
try to enjoy the journey. That's a shot bottom right from last from yesterday. There's my little steel battery hut. The solar array. You can see the little all sky camera out here near the end of the array. Uh, and that top guy is when I uh, I guess the first night I deployed it. I've got a few links and references here. Um, this middle guy here, um, Remote Control Observatory Handbook, that's, it's pretty dated, but conceptually, it's very sound. It, it does, um, concepts don't change, technology does. And of course, you, you are all aware of ADSCOM. Uh, there are some robotic software out there, CC the Autopilot, kind of it does require a person to start it off. I, I have no experience with Sequence Generator Pro. There's the Open Observatory Control System, and the uh, there's a couple a couple more the ecosystem. And we had somebody on a while ago, which was talking about another control system, planetary. Uh, and these are just packages, uh, Maxim DL or SkyX can be used for acquisition. There's a, a planetary package for lining up your packages, your your targets, rotations, and stuff. Um, these are just various vendors. The that that's this is a, a Hydron optical rain sensor. That's that little bubble thing next to the um, AAG cloud sensor that you saw. That's just purely a rain sensor. Works on refraction on a dome. Um, couple couple telescope uh, dome manufacturers. That's about it, really. If there's any other questions, there are a few questions. Um, okay. <laughs> Let me start at the, the first one. Uh, first of all, uh, John was asking whether there was any sort of time delay for your communications, your commands to the remote system from. It's it, it's it's like it's like it being in the backyard. I've got like fifty megabit connection out there. Yeah, it's and it, simple this... commands. As you were saying, it wasn't uh, the the high bandwidth stuff is uh, what we're looking at. The uh... yeah. So here here you go. I just I just clicked on refresh that page. That's the current time here. That's that's my that's my latest shot of the in inside the camera. Okay, this is my control box here the, that controls everything. Uh, there's a bunch of relays here. I can just turn equipment on and off. Like if I wanted to turn uh, the fan on, on, now it's running. I can also, um, where is it here? Digital outputs, uh, oh, here, here you go. There's a week schedule right here. Okay, so I can actually add things to here. These are uh, the different relays. I can just say I want uh, this guy to turn on at that time and on these days, and then you add it, and it, and the relay just comes on independent of the computer. Uh, and you can send. Uh, so that's that's one thing. This is uh the. This is actually what's happening right now in real time with the batteries. So you can see that um, there's 1.3 amps coming out of the array because it's just on float now. But there's actually shoving in 2.6 amps into the into the batteries, which sounds pretty freaky. And we have uh, 110 volts coming out of the uh, array right now. And that's that's the uh, that's what's going into the batteries, 143 watts. So it, it's it's maximum charge right now. Very cool. Um, another question from Steve Sagarian. Uh, yeah. What is your SQM? Do you know your SQM of your dark site? Haven't got a clue. It's dark. <laughs> I mean, I suspect that if you don't have power and uh, or you can't get power and you uh need a giant antenna for cell phone reception i'm mean, gonna guess it's pretty dark we were i was out there on the weekend looking around i can't see any halo of anything anywhere around me there nothing horizon to horizon black yeah. it's um, dark and i've looked up at the milky way and i you can see texture in it, it's so dark. It, you just kind of rubbing your eyes, going, "Wow, that, that's so weird." This is uh, this is me doing some testing here. That's my um, that's my little uh, telescope in there. So I, it, I have four millimeter clearance from beginning to end in that dome. <laughs> that's the that telescope is now in that one there, and you can see that's the deck. 
and the and the dome uh, it was running it truly was running in the backyard for um several months before i moved out um what software uh packages do you use to run the session which session uh you're basically your imaging session your imaging automation uh acp at this time okay yeah which is probably i, I would say the more common uh, package for any sort of automated remote observatory, at least at the moment. Yes, and I wrote a lot of scripts initially to do everything myself, like uh, powering on equipment, um, controlling the. Uh, I, I, ha I have an Arcos, so that whole system is, is controllable through um, scripting as well. I can set the you know, I can set the um, the fans running and all that stuff. And I wrote all that stuff, and, and actually, I I still use a lot of that. This is the, this is um, uh, inside um, that uh, control system. So there's a there's a 15 volt uh, rail here for my that goes off to the telescope. There's a a 12 volt for the air cost. I forget what that voltage is for right now. And again, if the wiring looks neat, it's generally good. Um. Uh, Larry's asking if you have any images to show off. Uh, I just uh, I just posted an image a couple, maybe twelve hours ago. On your uh, astro bin, that where it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll um, I'll, I'll just I'll bring that up right now. Okay, there you go. Oh, nice. Why, why don't you tell us your astro bin uh, username so people people could look you up? Hi. Uh, where, where's that located now? Uh, right there. It's, it's Terry Rob, Robes, Robeson. Oh, yeah? Yep. Okay. If I go back, look. Uh, Terry. There okay. There. There you go. Let's, uh... You can find them right there. Um, what brand is your dome? It's a um, scope dome. They come from Poland. So they're, they're a shipbuilder. And uh, they build domes as well. And the all of the circuitry is uh, all industrial switches. It's it's quite it's quite nice. I, um, it's a class above the the technical the technical innovations that I have here as well. Hmm. It, it's um, they're, they're, I, they can survive uh, very high strong winds as well. Uh, the Fiberglass is very substantial. It's a heavy guy. Like it, it, it um, they show two guys putting it together. They must be like incredibly strong. Like it took four of us just to pick up the panels in the middle section when we were erecting it. It just about killed us. <laughs> <laughs> so it's. Um, I, 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 we uh, in fact, uh, this is. I stuck the eyes on there. That was it getting delivered. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for the eyes. <laughs> And uh, initially, I started like this. Uh, that was that's my system that I moved into the dome. So it's 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 a it's not a big telescope. It's only a ten inch. There's 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 not very many of them made. There's the smallest ones that they ever made. The uh, this is the dome going into a truck. So it just just squeezed in. So after having it assembled, then disassembling it, and then reassembling it again. Uh, and I've helped a few people with domes, so I've done quite a few of these right now. It's um, they 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 are heavy, <laughs> but, but uh, I think that that's what you that's what you want. You don't want anything really flimsy. Yeah. Uh, um, they, and they, uh, and this is this is in the backyard as well. So I moved it from the small guy to the big guy, and there's a you know just having so much more room is, is great. And you can see the you can see the casters and stuff on here; they're actually quite strong, quite big. I don't know if you could if I zoom up on that. Well, that not this, oh, sorry, I don't have high enough resolution. I was going to show you the circuitry for the uh, the end of travel. It's yeah, you know, it's quite it's quite good. Uh, yes, having looks, scope scope domes are excellent. The problem with them in the U.S. is that they're they're expensive to ship. So uh, well, you have one further away. That's even more yeah. expensive. So actually, but good thing about that is if you get two of them, it's the same shipping. <laughs> exactly. 
<laughs> yeah, so if you if you want to get one, get two. Yeah, get a friend. Get get again buy two. That 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 that's the best way to do it, really. Uh, let's um, try and see if I, yeah, we we do have a question. Uh, I don't know how to ask this question because I think uh, it's difficult. Uh, David's asking how much money for this much fun, and while I don't want to put you on the spot and say uh, how much money have you spent, I think it's one of those cases where. Um, you're going to spend a lot of money. Yeah. All, how about if I answer with all of it? <laughs> right. Right. How much money you spend all of it? <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. I'm trying. Um, most of the stuff I've purchased has been secondhand or thirdhand, with the exception of the dome and the mount. Those are the only two things I have ever purchased new. Everything else I've built myself, or I've purchased pre-loved stuff. So there, so that helps a great deal. Yes, absolutely. I am a big proponent of buying uh, any sort of gear previously owned uh, because uh, if you love it, then you save some money, and if you hate it, you can sell it and probably get what you what you paid for it. Quite true. Quite true. Because the depreciation has already happened. Yep. Um, do you, so. Uh, something goes wrong. Do you have neighbors in that area? To no. <laughs> No. No. Now you do have a partner who you image with. I do. I do. So you can share the burden of uh, the terrible news, I guess. But uh, we, we we tend, yeah, we tend to go up there together because mm -hmm. we help each other out. Because um, yeah, uh, it's quite often you need a second set of hands. To, mm -hmm. to do something, you know, like uh, if you're working on something and or another brain, to, more importantly, it's great to have an imaging partner where you can bounce ideas from. You know, like you, you, if you sit there, I couldn't do this in isolation. You know, having another person who's going through the same thing and and you go, I, I have a problem with this. Oh, try this and, and the inverse. And together, you just plow through stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, it just, this hoarding of information, I could never understand that. It was just crazy stuff. So working together and sharing, we got, we have so much we've accomplished. It's a really, really good relationship that way. Yeah. Uh, first, uh, what was the rain sensor website? Uh, oh, is that your okay. Okay, there's two of them. There's um, AAG, um, uh, where is he? Uh, I'm just trying to find it here. I think I have a, oops, down at the very bottom here. Okay, the uh, AAG is, uh, I think it's uh, from uh, Lun Lun oh, yeah. Lun Lun Luniteco. Oh, yeah. Yep, yeah, they're, they're actually pretty good. The guy supports his product very well. I like that. That's quite good. Uh, and from what I can, what I understand, it's probably on par with the, uh, the Boltwood. Excluding uh, maybe the um, the, uh, the mechanism that measures humidity, it does um, like the the uh, the wind speed is probably better on the AAG. Uh, the Boltwood uses little uh, tubes that measure um, the wind that way. Uh, the Hyd Hydrion optical rain sensor that uses the same technologies that you would find in an automobile. A raindrop lands on the dome. It increases the length of travel of the beam it knows it's raining there's four thresholds that you can set light you know medium heavy and something else what you want to do being a secondary sensor you want to have its threshold different than your other guy so you rely on say the aag to do the, the grunt work and if that were to fail you have the secondary one set at a, another threshold where it might be actually sprinkling a bit but it's going to close because you don't want the two fighting yeah. So another thing with the you know running in the backyard, you got to set all your thresholds. So this equipment goes before this one, and this one's you know a secondary. This is a tertiary threshold. Very interesting. What is your uh, travel time from your home to your? Uh, 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 three hours. Three hours. Yeah. So I I I really don't want to go up there if I don't have to. No. Um. Uh, also, Nicole's asking, what place in Australia is, is this located? And I'm going to ask, I'm going to tack on to that question. What caused you to choose this particular site? Uh, did you use the overhead map and find the dark skies? Did you look in the newspaper for sites for sale? 
uh, what, what went into your decision? Uh, well, it's it's quite far away. Melbourne's quite a large city. It's about about close to four mil four million. So it's um, very very bright. I used to do a lot of narrowband imaging, and it's now to the point where I can't even do that because they've installed LED lighting everywhere, and I get all and I just can't filter it out. And I and I I thought it'd be far more of a crime having this expensive gear sitting here never using it. Now I have gear out there that's imaging at every opportunity and to me that makes sense economically i know it sounds it's not i, I don't see that as a justification i think it'd be worse crime to have gear sitting around that's capable and not being used i think that would be very very poor we had to get far enough out in the dome we far enough away from the light dome here <laughs> which is you know two two and a half hours away from melbourne and uh we looked for some properties out there, and we found we found somebody that we could rent a small spot, a small block from, and and uh, it's just sitting on on somebody's property. Interesting. Um, uh, Larry is asking when your paper describing in detail your system, including schematics, diagrams, etc., coming out, and I'm sure he wants a, <laughs> I'm sure he wants a part. <laughs> Uh, uh, the, uh, the the only problem with that is that it, absolutely everybody's system is different, right? There's uh, never two the same. This is really more of a conceptual talk, really. Um, this is one of those cases where I think if you need schematics and a parts list, uh, you're better off going back in and redesigning the system for yourself because you need to know why you need all of those items. It's basically the redundancy that you need for your particular system. Yeah, and if something falls, I I generally know how to fix it because I built it. Like I built I built all of the control systems. I didn't build the controller for the scope dome, so I, th that's a vendor. I didn't I didn't uh, build the controller for the telescope. That's a vendor. Mostly everything else I've built. So I, I know how to fix it, and I actually have a spare. I have a, that that box that I have there. I got a, I got a, a newer version. Sitting in the other dome here, that I, uh, I and it everything is everything is matching. All the plugs are exactly the same. I, I use the same calls to do everything. So I just rip it out, drive up there, put it in. Mm -hmm. I have another computer sitting here right beside me, which is another industrial computer, r imaged, ready to go with a drop of a hat. And that's very very important. Yeah, I don't know about you, but setting up a computer from scratch. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to take you know four days realistically, just getting to a point where you, that's even before you um, you dial in all the configurations. Yep. It's a, it's a in our hobby, setting it up from scratch, reinstalling the OS, reinstalling all the drivers is not a guarantee that everything is going to work. Correct. Um, it's I, a, I, yeah. I have a laptop that just won't recognize all of my hardware at one time. Um, for whatever reason, I don't know. My other laptop, my my twelve year old laptop works fine. This three year old laptop that I bought to replace it won't work. Some some people would call that a feature. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Here's here's when I first started looking at it initially in the backyard. Right. So this is what I started with. Look at the floor. You don't want to have it like that, okay? Because <laughs> that would be a disaster in remote location. So. I got it from that point to where you saw it, where there's absolutely nothing on the floor. And this is all going through and, and actually exercising all the equipment, saying what could go wrong? How do I tidy this up? What can I remove from the system? The fewer components, the better, but you do have to have redundancies. But there's even a little UPS right here. This is um, uh, uh, 1500 KVA, uh, 1500. Uh, UPS, but in the end, this, there's no need for UPS because I'm actually running off an 11 kilowatt UPS. Right. So off that goes. You know, like it was just silly thinking. You know, like you thought, oh, I need one. Why do I need one? <laughs> so yeah, that's redundant. We don't need that. Um, is your your uh, dome isn't air conditioned? Is that? No, no, no. Now, it, being off the ground, um, you have this airflow through these slits and 
with that uh, grid under there, that screen, it's it's like laminar airflow. Mm -hmm. And and it uh, there's no gusting or anything. It's just this gentle rise of uh, cool air. You can from from under the deck where it's shaded all the time. It, and you walk in there, it's actually cooler than outside. Mm -hmm. And uh, this thing equalizes very very quickly because there's there's no insulation on the dome either, so it reflects a lot of the light. But in the well, as soon as the sun drops down, the temperature drops very quickly. Here's another thing you might want to consider as well. I didn't talk about. This is the back of my telescope. This looks really weird, but what that is, it, it's a heater strap, and I got a bunch of uh, tinfoil wrapped around that as well. And this is running 24-7. It probably consumes about 40 watts max, maybe 30 watts, but it's always heating the mirror. That whole bum end of the telescope is heated, and those fans will, will pull anything off during, during the imaging session. But it's it's cheaper for me to heat the telescope than it would be to run a dehumidifier or any of that other stuff. Because again, you're always worried about power in this situation. Mm -hmm. and that was a very, very economical way of keeping the optics dry and the optics clean. The rest of the telescope could be sweaty and, and, and has water, but it, I was really interested in the optical surfaces. <laughs> and Larry is asking if DigiKey delivers to Australia. Did you, um, uh, did did you key? They're like a, an electronics, uh, specialized electronics vendor. Yes, they do. Yes, yes, you can. Uh, well, I, I think I've ordered some stuff from them. Yeah, I, I, I ordered some industrial 486 controllers. Mm -hmm. It's like a, the two, like the normal comms, but it's the industrial version that has a you know, much more robust. I love serial connections because they're just so reliable. I'm not a I'm not, not a USB guy because <laughs> they're unreliable. Besides your heating module, do you do anything otherwise to keep the optics clean? Do you have a problem with dust out there? So, so what I do once a year is I go out there and clean the optics, and I'm afraid to take the sucker apart because there's no spare parts for the our, our cost. So I have this long, long tube. And I, I put a bag over the secondary, point it down. I have uh, some um, distilled water that's uh, used in the medical industry. And I just hose the, uh, the mirror down from, from the open end of the OTA shooting up. It just keeps going that for about 10 minutes. Then I have this long plastic tube with a, with a, with a jet um, fan on it. And that just strips the moisture right off the surface of the mirror without even touching it. And it's clean. Yeah, so I, um, and that way, I, I, that way, I don't have to worry about disconnecting a connector and then connect it, and it sort of perishes because it's like, you know, twelve years old, right? Yeah, <laughs> that would be a disaster. <laughs> and and the cheapest part, yeah, you know, like the solar cells are actually very cheap. That was probably one of the cheaper components. They're not that they're not that bad. You see, they're quite large. That's one point six meters by a meter wide, right? So yeah, I have uh, 15 of those. That's a, quite a surface area. Mm -hmm. But the batteries I, are expensive. The batteries are the killer. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the tech, the tech is uh, it's like religion, right? Because whatever you read sounds best. <laughs> but I wanted something that required no moving parts. It, they have the same quality as the lead acid battery. And they can use the same technology as well. Mm -hmm. and, they, and 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 you can abuse them and they and they come back yeah yeah so it's like we we're moving stuff out there initially we just re uh, rented a truck these are all the batteries sitting in the bottom that's the control box there uh so basically power comes in from that side and exits that side um that's the controller that's a, that's a, that's the charger it comes up into the top box which is which is a 48 volt bus bar go, which then goes down to the batteries uh, there's temperature probes on the batteries. Uh, this is uh, the 240 AC here. These are breakers up here. Um, DC breaker, there's an uh, AC breaker. There's also another breaker going um, out to this guy here, uh, to this um, 
when, I, when I'm in, inside the dome working, this is a uh, mains power here. So I plug in my laptop here. I plug in chargeable drills, whatever I need when I'm working on site. Just plug it in there, and I got 240 volts. Yeah. Very cool. <clears throat> so I see we've hit uh, we've hit the close to an hour mark. If anyone out there has any questions they really want to get in, please type them into chat now. Uh, same goes for people in the room. Uh, keep going, Terry. Ah. Uh, um I, I go too fast, did I? <laughs> no, no. I just I I, no, I heard you starting to talk. I didn't want to interrupt you. Oh no, 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 no. That that that's fine. Um, I was trying to think of anything other than um, cable. Cables are probably something to really focus on. I know it sounds boring, but they're going to give you more grief than anything else. I also run water cooling on my system as well. I I put a water. Uh, cooler out there on, on the weekend this is a picture when i used to go bush uh i don't know if i could see it on here okay, here we go this is this is what i used to take out all the time so this is just a radiator and a pc uh water cooling guy and on the end of the camera you can't see it there are these dry brake connectors they have a little ball bearing in it. So you just connect it, disconnect it. So when I would rip all this stuff out, I would just take the system, disconnect it, and I, this this would go for a year. I used to take this out the bush every every new moon. So it would take me three hours to rip it out of the dome, travel on site, and it would then take three hours to assemble it on site. And then we'd image for two days and we, you know, uh, at, our, at the Astronomical Society dark site. Then we uh, then I have another three hours to rip it down, another three hours and put it up. So it's like six uh, 12 hours of you know, erecting and doing all the stuff just to go imaging for two days. And this is another reason why having a dome is really, really nice. In fact, this is what I used to do back in the day. I put a. I used to uh, put a screen around it to stop the wind from buffeting, and that's just a uh, a shade cloth, and that made an amazing amount on uh, on imaging. Because when you're imaging at a couple of meters, a little bit of a breeze is quite substantial, and it can be quite. You can see the trees are moving quite a lot, but inside, perfectly calm, and I and I could image. There's a lot of wires there. And that's that. That uh, my cabling is all very different from from there. Uh, that's the stuff on my Flickr account. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also, it's all, yeah, I've also got a lot more images on Flickr than I do on the other one. I don't know if I uh, can find that for you. Hold on, uh, back. Uh, probably just type. Probably just type Terry Robinson and uh, Flickr, and you might get these things. That's probably that's probably the easiest way. There's probably yeah. This is probably yeah. This goes back in to when I first started. Like this 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 here is my first first image I've ever done with my system. That was my first light image, and that was that was imaging through HA filters. So they were 10 second uh, integrations through on the guider. So you can do long exposures on a guider and, and get a reasonable shot. I was, so my, my guider, um, so this is the SBIG where the guide chip is behind the filters. And this is through an HA filter. Interesting. Yeah, yeah so I, 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 um, I get that. Yeah. How low does your temperature go? Do you ever have concerns about the batteries uh, getting too low of a temperature? Um, the chemistry lasts longer, but um, I think um, you're, you're, it gets cold where you are, right? Uh, batteries yeah. will, batteries are not freezing they they become mm -hmm. they don't have as much charge that they'll give up it gets just you know just below freezing here I, I was there on the weekend and I got up in the morning that you know the car was ice uh -huh. the dome was full of ice until about nine o'clock until all the ice disappeared mm -hmm. so not not like not like where I'm used to like I'm I'm from Canada originally we you know we quite okay. regularly get like 40 below or something right so not yeah. like that <laughs> I know a lot of the Canadian imagers uh, will go uh, like 20 below frequently. Yeah. We hit yeah. 20 below uh, Celsius, like uh, 
and not not very often. Yeah, uh, yeah. But uh, it happens on occasion. But your batteries Heat. are outside all the time, so it's not like. Uh... Yeah, yeah. Heat heat is a killer for batteries. They will shorten the chemistry once you get over thirty degrees. The chemistry is is halved, the life expectancy. So you want you do want to protect your batteries from getting too hot. Mm -hmm. Oh that, yeah, that's looks yeah. like. Uh, George, I think looked up the looked up your batteries, and it it says they have a wide operating range, negative forty to uh, sixty five degrees Celsius. Uh, they wouldn't last. They wouldn't last longer than sixty five degrees, though. Right, right. Yeah, but it's it's the uh, the at uh, twenty five degrees, the chemistry in the lead carbon batteries apparently is twenty years. Mm -hmm. If it's at twenty degrees, it's longer. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, I don't know if any of that stuff is useful for you guys, but that's kind of what I've been doing oh, for a while. Absolutely. Very, very cool presentation. Um, oh. thank, thank you for uh, presenting. This is um, uh, what I'll say the most technically challenging way to set up an observatory. Uh, but if you enjoy the technical challenge, it's probably the most rewarding way because uh, Terry did everything. Um, you can uh, rent space in a in a, an observatory that's already built, but uh, you're at their you're at their mercy. Uh, Terry had the opportunity to really set everything up and do it exactly the way he wants and uh, put it exactly where he wanted. Um, but it's a feat. It's uh, really an accomplishment. So, uh, thank you for sharing. Con congratulations on a on a great uh, project and uh, really having it operating well. Yeah. Oh, th th and uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, chat about my, my I guess my passion or one of them. <laughs> That's nice. There. Oh, yeah. Th this is this is not the same as uh, like I do remotes, but this is this is at another level. Yeah. I mean, this is like Mar Mars Rover kind of remote, you know, <laughs> where you have, you know, if my USB, uh, you know, there's somebody I can send some, make a phone call and the tech will go out there and just unplug the USB cord. Uh, this is something else. I'm tech support. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'd rather not have to do too many calls because it is, it is a long way to travel. So this actually on this flicker here is probably my last image, which I might be able to pull up at a higher resolution. Uh, this this guy here, I started three years. I started three years ago. This 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 object here. Okay. Uh, let's see. If I can do that one here, that one here, and I'll open them up in another open tab. Yeah. So. It should open here. Okay, yeah. So I started this guy three years ago. Whoops. And it's taken taken me that long to, to, to get the data for it. Hmm. And I like I love these little jets out here. They're just so Yeah, cool. yeah. Very cool. Uh, and I love all the galaxies when you start looking at all the galaxies everywhere in the background. They're just amazing. This is a I I um a bit of a crop. There's more on the outside. And I didn't know whether or not to have it because, you know, the planetaries are generally not very big. Although this is a fairly big planetary, it's a very old planetary because it doesn't have any boundaries. It's just a big blob of stuff. Generally, the planetary, you'll see shock waves and, and really distinct boundaries. None of that is present here. Great image. I think you might be able to see that from up there. I'm not sure. Um, I think uh, Josh shot it from somewhere down south. I think it might be a little bit too south for me. I'm not quite sure. Um, okay. I remember looking it up. I remember being amazed by it. Um, but my southern view is the worst of all of my views uh, from both of the sites that I shoot from. Uh, yeah, minus 25. So, yeah, you probably would have a hard time with that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like the cave nebula for me would be maybe 40 degrees above the horizon. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's, uh, yeah, oh, no, fo the fo fox fur, sorry, the fox fur one. Okay. 
Yeah, and I, then I, I, you guys got those really nice bubbles, which I love to have a go at that. And you have those Einstein um, rings and stuff. I, we don't have very many of those here. That, they look amazing. Mm -hmm. Oh, any other questions uh, at all? I haven't seen any other questions. Uh, you're getting a few thanks uh, for a great presentation and a, and a great observatory. Um, yeah, I think uh, <clears throat> really great presentation. Again, thank you, Terry. Um, I don't have a presentation scheduled yet for next week. I might have something. Otherwise, uh, we'll either have an open session or I will post something uh, midweek. Um, I may start canceling one or two shows a month if we don't have a session. I just can't come up with a good topic. Uh, but I'll give you advance notice on that, hopefully, in the show before. Uh, I would expect next week we are on. Uh, that said, one more time, thanks again, Terry. Uh, thank you all for watching. Um, submit your images onto our website and otherwise clear skies and have a good night.